So, okay. So, now, there's a number of things to consider if you're thinking about performance prediction, and one of them is, to what degree do people vary in terms of their performance capacity? And you might say, well, there's very little performance variability, or you might say there's a tremendous amount of per performance variability, or you might say there's an absurd amount of performance variability. And it turns out that the claim that there's an absurd amount of performance variability is the proper claim. IQ is normally distributed, so is conscientiousness, but productivity is distributed along the Pareto distribution, and I'll show you why. And that follows a law called Price's Law from someone named Derek DeSola Price, who was studying scientific productivity in the early 1960s. And what he showed was that a vanishingly small proportion of the scientists operating in a given scientific domain produced half the output. And so what you see, and this, what's happening is that to do really well at a given productive task, which would also include generating money as a, as a proxy for, for, for creative productivity, is that you have to be, a bunch of things have to go your way simultaneously. So maybe you have to be really, really smart, you have to be really, really lucky, you have to be really healthy, you have to be really energetic, you have to be really conscientious, you have to be in the right time at the right place. And maybe you also have to have the right social network, right? Like, so it's a lot of things, and each of those are sort of small probability they're, they're each of those are small probabilities, and then if you multiply the small probabilities together, you get an extraordinarily tiny probability. And you have to have all those things functioning before you're going to end out on the, on, the, on the extreme end of the productivity distribution. But if you do end up there, then you produce almost all of everything. So it's a tiny number of people that produce almost all of everything. That's Price's law. And technically it is, and I, I mentioned this to you before, it's the square root law. The square root of the number of people in a productive domain produce half the output. Right? So if you have 10 employees, three of them produce half the output. If you have 100, 10 of them produce half the output. If you have 10,000, 100 of them produce half the productive output. And so what that also means is that because there's massive variability in performance, you don't have to shift your ability to predict performance very, very, very much up towards being better at it to gain substantially on the positive side because there's so much difference in productivity. And that actually happens to be also a function of the complexity of the job. If the job is simple, which is, means you can, this job has 10 rules, you know, maybe that's a janitorial job, let's say. You know, you do, you, it takes a little while to learn it, but once you've learned it, you basically do the same thing all the time. There's not a lot of performance variability in those jobs, and most of that would be eaten up by conscientiousness, and also to some degree by neuroticism, because the higher, people who are higher neuroticism would be more likely to miss work. But, you're, but, but general cognitive ability, for example, is not a good predictor at all. It'll predict how fast you learn the tasks initially, but not how well you perform the tasks. But if the tasks you're doing are shifting constantly, so your responsibilities change, or you're in a creative job where you're constantly solving new problems, those are kind of the same thing, then uh, IQ, as the complexity of the job increases, the predictive utility of IQ increases, which is only to say that smarter people can handle complex situations faster. It's like that doesn't seem like a particularly radical claim. So Price's law dictates that there's massive individual productivity differences between people, so increasing your predictive your capacity for predicting performance even by small increments has a huge economic consequence that was established in the 1990s. The equations were first developed in the 1990s and that's part of the reason that I started working on performance prediction tests because I read the economics and I thought, oh my god, you can produce a test that costs $30 times, say maybe you have 50 applicants for the position, $1,500 to administer and it'll produce an increments of something like 30% of salary permanently for the person that you put in the position. So let's say you hire a $75,000 employee and it increases their productivity by 30%, so we'll say roughly $25,000. You get a $25,000 return on a $1,500 investment every single year that person occupies the position. On average, that's four years. That's a $100,000 payoff for your $1,500 investment. I read that and I thought, oh, that'll be easy to sell. It's like wrong. Wrong. Even though the economic payoff was so massive, I, I told you the other impediments that, that emerged. But the, the arithmetic, or the capacity to produce these calculations was established in the, in the 1990s. And I'll show you the equations in a, in a bit here. Okay, so we already talked about what a normal distribution looks like. That's the red line. And a normal distribution emerges as a consequence of chance processes. So we'll take a look at those here. 
All right, so here's a Pareto distribution. This is the distribution. Remember I showed you with the creative achievement questionnaire that almost everybody stacked up at zero? People have zero creative output. The median person has zero lifetime creative output. And then there's a tiny proportion that are way the hell out on the you know, right-hand end of the distribution, right? Those are the people have, who have, everything is cycling forward for them. And as they get more well-known, of course, they get more opportunities as well. So I just, I'll just run this simulation for you, okay? And, and this shows you why the Pareto distribution emerges. Now you have to watch this quickly because it's a fairly fast animation. So here's what happens. Everybody starts out with $10. There's a, there's a thousand people playing the game. Everybody starts out with $10. We, I have a dollar, you have a dollar. I flip a coin. If I get heads, you give me a dollar. If, if, you, if I get tails, I give you a dollar. We, we go around and we trade with everyone. Okay, so the first thing that happens when people start to trade is this. Normal distribution develops, right? Because some people lose and some people win. It's just like the golden board that I showed you. Okay, so you keep playing. People start to stack up at zero. Watch. Because they lose 10 times in a row. Bang, they're done. The bottom graph is a graph of the entropy of the distribution, which increases as the game continues. <coughs> because at the beginning it's maximally ordered, right? Everybody has exactly the same amount. Now it's being distributed. Same equations apply to the distribution of gas into a vacuum. Well, what happens? Now someone, you know, there are people out there at the, at the $50 range, or at the $60 range, or at the $70 range, you keep playing it? Well, eventually what happens, if you play it right to its conclusion, is that one person ends up with all the money. So that's to those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken. That's the law of economic productivity. It's called Matthew, it's the Matthew principle. Um, and it's actually an economic principle that was derived from a saying in the New Testament. I'll tell you some more about this on Tuesday because I didn't get through all of it. And I, want to, I want to finish up the performance prediction lecture um, and show you a couple of things I didn't get to show you the last time that we talked. And then I want to do the closing lecture since we're done today. So we'll start with the, the performance prediction end. So I've been thinking more about this Pareto distribution issue because it's, it's a really big deal and, and I, it's, it's difficult, it's still difficult for me to understand. See, I didn't really learn about this till about 10 years ago, which is quite a shock to me because it's such a fundamental phenomenon that it seems to me that it would have been addressed in my training somewhere along the way. And so, um, and so I'm still thinking it through, what it means exactly. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting thing. You know that IQ is normally distributed, and it's a good predictor of long-term performance. And conscientiousness is normally distributed, and it's a good predictor of long-term performance. And, and, so, and openness is also uh, normally distributed, and it's a good predictor of creative behavior. But Creative output is not normally distributed. It's distributed in this weird Pareto distribution that, that's indexed here. And I showed you that with the Creative Achievement Questionnaire most specifically because that provides a really concrete example of it. Um, so it looks like the capacity to think creatively might be normally distributed. That would be openness, say, and intelligence. But the consequence of that turns into this strange Pareto distribution. And the Pareto distribution with regards to creative achievement was best, the, 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 the catastrophe of it in some sense is best indexed by the fact that if I remember correctly, 70% of people who complete the creative achievement questionnaire, which indexes lifetime creativity, score zero. So, and zero is a strange number, you know, zero isn't like other numbers. And the, the part of the reason for that is that it's difficult to do anything with nothing. So, you know, if you, if you buy a stock and the, and the price sinks to like two cents a stock, you're still alive. But if the price sinks to zero, you're done, right? That's it. The, the game's over. And that's the thing about zero. When, when you're hit zero, or maybe when you're at zero, the game is over. And so there's these weird barriers to moving forward in life. And you see this, there's a poverty trap that's sort of like this too. Like if you're, if you're so broke that you can't keep up with paying your bills, it's really, really difficult to get out of that because you can't get a bank account, for example, and you can't pay your rent. To a certain, and th there's, there's, there's economies of scale that you can't take advantage of because you don't have any money at all. And so you can't get going in the game. And then, so there's the problem of starting out with zero, which is a big problem and very difficult to get out of. And then there's the problem of falling to zero if you are in the game, because when you fall to zero, then it's very difficult to get going again. And so, now I, I, I want to show you something about how, how trading games work. Um, 
so I think we stopped we closed with this last time but so this is a this is a graph that shows you how a monopoly game starts roughly speaking but you could say this is how you would set up the world if you wanted perfect equity if you wanted everybody to have the same outcome everybody would have uh, the same amount of money in this case it's ten dollars and so it's 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 dollars along the along the bottom axis and its number of players along the left hand axis and you can think about this as a monopoly game everybody starts with the same amount of money and then you start trading randomly and you know if 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 you have ten dollars and you're trading a dollar each trade if you have enough people some unlucky person is going to end up with zero dollars after ten trades and if they end up with one dollar after nine trades they still have a chance of recovery it's a low chance but it's not zero but once they hit zero they're out of the game and so what happens is if you run this simulation you have people flip a coin to determine how they're going to trade then this is what happens so the first thing that happens is you generate a normal distribution because some people win and some people lose and most people sort of half win and half lose but some lose continually and some win continually and so it turns into a normal distribution that's fine but then when the game continues to play then what happens is that people start to stack up on the zero end of things and a, a tiny proportion at the upper end and if you play the game right to cessation which is what you do if you play Monopoly for example somebody ends up with all the money and the funny thing about playing Monopoly as you know if you've played Monopoly multiple times is that the probability that you'll win continually across games is pretty low you know it, there's a lot of randomness in Monopoly and if you play with the same five people ten games the probability is pretty good you're not going to win more than two games so so there's chance elements that come into play that determine the outcome and and so anyways I, I was thinking about this more a little bit more last night and somebody asked me, you know, I was talking about it with somebody, and uh, he, he asked me if the Pareto distribution was a necessary consequence of the fact that production is number one, measured, and number two, social. And that's, that, I thought that was a really interesting question. It's like, do you get a Pareto distribution every time creative output ends up being measured in some way? And even if you can conceptualize it, so because it might be the the idea might be that anything that you can assign monetary value to is first of all is something you can measure because assigning monetary value to something is in fact measuring it right you're measuring it with money and then as soon as you assign a monetary value to it you can you can trade it you can trade it and it also takes on some aspects of a zero sum game and most of the things that we talked about with regards to um, the production of Pareto distributions were measured entities and were, um, were, were trading games as well. So even, because I, I mentioned to you, for example, that number of, of basketball hoops successfully managed in, by NBA players is Pareto distributed. But that's also, those are measurable with money, because of course you get paid to do it, and, it's a, and it is a social game. And so maybe it is an inevitable consequence of trading in a social game that you produce Pareto outcomes. And then I was trying to figure out why. And I've, I've, I've always had the suspicion that what happens to people is that as they move towards zero, positive feedback loops get set up so they're more likely to hit zero. And as they move away from zero, positive feedback loops get set up so that they're increasingly more likely to move away from zero.